We're going to be in Acts 25 as we hear from the life of Paul. What is going on in the life of the Apostle Paul? So Acts chapter 25 this morning. This week we're going to be in Acts 25. I believe it's the pinnacle of it. This is the crux of the passage. And then next week we're going to cover Acts 25, 26, 27, and 28. So put the crock pot on slow next week, okay? Or just bring your really fast ears, all right? And we'll cover all of that. So Acts 25 this morning, as we look at the life of Paul, as I was studying for this this week, I thought, how do I introduce Acts chapter 25? So I went with the very quotable and famous Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss said, today I shall behave as if it was the day I will be remembered. There's a lot of truth to that, friends. How we interact, how we behave, how we handle ourselves, each day people will remember. We want them to remember the good. Sometimes they remember the times of growth in our life. But we look at the life of Paul. Paul was always about making sure the gospel was center, making sure he was always telling people about the good news of Jesus. And he lived each day of his life being remembered for being a pillar of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's go to Acts chapter 25 this morning. As we get familiar with this map, this is going to be our map for the next week and or two as we finish up the life of Paul. Paul is down here on this red arrow. It all started in Jerusalem. Remember, he was coming out of Ephesus in Asia, coming back to Jerusalem to give a report about what God was doing in the life of the Gentile believers. And he was bringing back money to be able to give to the church in Jerusalem because as they were struggling. As he was on his way, there was a prophecy in Acts 21, Agabus, and they said, hey, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound by the Gentiles, and it's going to be really, really bad. And then he said, it's okay, it's God's will. He goes to Jerusalem, and he is now in Caesarea, which is the seat of the Roman government. From Acts 25, he's going to go through the rest of the map, the orange arrows, and end up in Rome over here in and purple next week and that's going to finish our study. And so Paul is on the road and he has the promises of God that God has given him. But in Acts 25, starting in verse 1, we have a new governor, Festus. Now let's go back and look at Acts 24, starting in verse 27 because that gives us the immediate context. You look and it says, after two years had passed, Paul spent two years in prison. We read that and we think, oh, that's not too bad. Two years is two years. And he continued to minister even though he was given a bad hand, he continued to share the gospel. And Felix is out now as the governor because he treated the Jewish people poorly. There's a new governor in. His name is Festus. And Festus is going to come in. He's going to be a good guy. But Festus is going to be a good guy in a tight spot. So Festus then, having arrived in the Providence, or what happened is Festus moved into the governor's mansion. And Festus has a problem. It's Paul, because nobody knows what to do with Paul. Because we know Paul is innocent, but we're going to see in Scripture again this morning, for political moves, it's better that Paul stay in prison. So Festus then, having arrived into Providence, three days later, on his third or fourth day in office as governor, Festus decides to head up from to Jerusalem from Caesarea. So let's look at this in the map. Caesarea to Jerusalem. Caesarea is the top red arrow. Jerusalem is the bottom red arrow. They're about 60 miles apart. 
For you and I, 60 miles, that's about an hour. We get in our car, we turn it on, and we go, and we get there a mile a minute. Well, for Festus, that is about five days' journey. Even if he went three, that's 20 miles a day that he is either walking or he is riding. This is not an easy move for him to go from Caesarea to Jerusalem. But Festus also realizes the political powers that are in the government that he has received. Yes, Rome is in charge, but the Jewish people are very, very, very political. So Festus says, I need to go from the capital. I need to come down to Jerusalem to figure out, to get a lay of the land. I need to come out and see what's going on so I can get a pulse of the people, the people that I am now governing. Because Felix, he didn't do too well with the Jewish people. Festus says, I want to learn from his mistakes. And I want to go make friends with the Jewish people. What better way than to go make friends with the Jewish people than to go visit them in Jerusalem? So So while Festus is there, the chief priest and the leading men of the Jews brought charges against Paul. Hey Festus, welcome to your new house as governor. Boy, do we have some things to say to you. Sit down. We don't like Paul. And if you go back to Acts 24-7, it's been two years since Paul has been in prison. And these guys, these leading chief priests and the leading men of the Jews, they haven't forgotten about Paul. Remember, their one goal about Paul is to stop him and to stop the message that he is preaching to the Gentiles. They don't like Paul because of the gospel that he is sharing. So here comes Festus, new guy in town, and here come the religious leaders that he's walking into Jerusalem, and you can see the political spinning that's happening at the very beginning of Festus's time in office. How long has he been there? Three days. He's already in the spin zone of Jerusalem. So they brought charges against Paul and they were urging Festus and they were requesting a favor. Hey Paul, or hey Festus, we have this favor that we want to ask you. Really what they're saying is we have political clout and we know that we can spin you. And why would they say that? Because they knew they had Felix. They knew that they could spin and hold Felix in their hand. So they're saying and they're trying out the new governor to see what they can do. And they're saying, hey, governor, we have this concession or this favor that it really involves Paul. Hey, listen, Festus, we want him, being Paul, to be brought to Jerusalem. We want him to have a trial in Jerusalem. We want him brought from Caesarea that's up here, the 60 miles, and brought down to Jerusalem so that we can have a trial. This is a religious matter. This is a religious issue. New governor, we're politically motivating you. We've got our lobbyist here. And we want him brought down to Jerusalem so that we can have this trial. But look at what scripture says. It's not about a trial, friends. It's about a motivation. At the same time, they were setting an ambush to kill him. Turning your Bibles to Acts 23, starting in verse 12. 23, starting in verse 12. When Paul was going from Jerusalem to Caesarea, they said, boy, this is going to be pretty quick. We'll just kill him. But then as Pastor Adam preached a few weeks ago, they put a whole crew around Paul and you couldn't get to Paul. But these guys that had this oath, and this oath started in verse 12, that they would not eat or drink until they had killed Paul. How long has Paul been in jail? Two years. Now, I really can't make it without food for two hours, let alone two years. I know that's a shock for some of you. I'm going to let that sit in for a minute, let you process that as you eat your muffins in front of me. I'm okay with that. Not really. They look good, so can you stop? It's distracting. 
two years they made this oath. So these guys had to go back and, if you will, buy out of that oath that they made. And they're renewing this oath in Acts 25 to say, oh, hey, new governor, maybe he doesn't know about the plot that happened in Acts 23. Hey, we have this idea. Let's bring Paul down to Jerusalem. He'll never make it to Jerusalem. We're going to reignite that militia to try to kill Paul that as he goes from Caesarea to Jerusalem, we're going to kill him. And then our problem is solved. Because it's obvious that Rome's not going to do it for us. We'll take matters into our own hands and we'll kill him in Jerusalem. But Festus is in Jerusalem and he's not new to the political scene. It's new to the office. But he knows what's going on. He's a fair man, and he heard their request, and he said that Paul was being kept in custody at Caesarea. He looked at him and said, no, we're not moving Paul from Caesarea to Jerusalem. That's a misuse of time, effort, energy, police power, and he's already where he needs to be. And that he himself would about to leave shortly. Hey, listen, guys, I'm not going to sit in Jerusalem and I'm not going to have this court case where I'm not living here. Paul's in Caesarea. I live in Caesarea. You all can bring the best of the best and you come to Caesarea and that's where we're going to have the trial. We're going to have it in the seat of the government in Caesarea. And if there is anything wrong about Paul, we will prosecute him there. So Festus, the new governor, said, no, we're not going to do the political scene. We're going to have it in Caesarea. So what did the religious leaders do? They went and Festus spent about eight to ten more days among them. How long has Festus been in office before he goes from Caesarea to Jerusalem? Three days. And if we take the high of 10 days, he's been in office less than two weeks. And he's got this, quote, Paul issue to deal with. Felix didn't know how to deal with him, so he did the best thing he knew. Put him in jail and hope the problem goes away. Festus comes in and says, here comes me two weeks in. I don't know what to do, but I've got this political problem with Paul. So two weeks, he went down to Caesarea, and after he gets to Caesarea, he took his seat on the tribunal. He sits in court, and he acts as the judge, and he says, Paul, I need you to come before me. We're going to figure this out. Enough is enough. Because Festus is a fair man, but Festus is not so much of a political guy. And he's got Paul that he, quote, inherited that nobody knows what to do with. So he says, bring Paul out. So Paul comes out and after he arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem, why do they come down but go north? Because of the geography. Jerusalem is very high, so you have to come down the hill and then walk north. That's why it says they came down from Jerusalem. This group of people stood around him. I have many questions about the text that I don't know the answer to, but if the good Lord allows, when I get to heaven, I want to sit next to Paul and say, so Paul, were you intimidated? Because you got all these people sitting around you that they have one goal in mind, to kill you. That's the goal. Paul, are you intimidated? And I wonder what Paul felt and looked like, because I want to direct your attention to Acts 23.11. Acts 23, 11, Paul has been in these fires and in this storm before. And God spoke to Paul in Acts 23, 11, and the Lord said to Paul, and he stood at his side and said, Paul, take courage. For as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must also witness in Rome as well. So Paul, sitting in Caesarea, He's got God's promise given to him by God himself. And Paul said, saying, I'm in Caesarea. I got to get over to Rome. Was Paul just sitting there going, this is going to be fine. How is this going to work out? Or was Paul taking and wringing his hands, not worried because we never have any worry. Bible says, do not worry, right? 
But a lot of us have a lot of concern. Did you hear the difference? Was Paul concerned? Or was he just sitting back here going, hey, I wonder how God's going to work this out. Because he was living his life in the promise of God's word. So, the Jews had come down from Jerusalem and they stood around them. Paul sent her saying, I got this promise from Acts 23. I'm going to Jerusalem, or I'm going to Rome. I don't know how I'm getting there, but I know that God will never give me a promise and not follow through on it. So there's a group of guys around him. They're bringing many serious charges against him. I'll come back and get that in a few minutes. So they're lobbying and they're throwing all of these serious accusations against Paul. But notice what scripture says. They cannot prove the charges. One of the charges was that Paul brought in a Gentile to the temple. And it was about Trophimus. Now how long has it been? Two years. These guys that quote made this accusation, they're gone. No one can find them. No one knows where they are. No one even knows who they are. No one can even bring them back because they made up the story to begin with. So they have Paul standing here with many charges that they're lobbying, but they cannot prove the charges that they are making. So Paul stood up and said it his own defense. He is defending himself. Let's not miss the intelligence of Paul. And let's not miss the calm demeanor of Paul, that he was able to articulate what happened in his life time and time and time again. If you read through Acts 23, read through Acts 24, he gives his defense. He is very well spoken and he sticks to the truth. We talked about that last week. Always only ever tell the truth. And Paul is articulating his defense. Reminds me of the verse that talks about do not be worried when you have to give a defense. The God will speak in and through you. Paul's standing up there going against, quote, professional lawyers. And Paul's this Pharisee whose life has been changed by Christ. And he's saying, here's what's going on. Look what he says. I'm speaking in my own defense. I have committed no offense either against the law of the Jews. So the Jewish people are saying he's speaking wrongly about the Old Testament. He's speaking against what we believe. And Paul's saying, where are your witnesses? I don't have any. So Paul is saying, I haven't spoken against the law of the Jews. I haven't done anything against the temple. I haven't done anything to bring disrespect or to contaminate the temple. That's Acts 23. That's Acts 24. Paul says, I didn't do that. I came in to worship. I was there less than two weeks. And one week of that, I was in the covenant. I didn't have time. I didn't do anything wrong against the temple, and I haven't done anything against Caesar. So the Jewish people, look at what they're doing. Sit back. Here are their three charges. Remember the previous verse I told you that they lobbied these serious charges? If you're an underliner and a circler and a writer, write the serious charges in verse 7. These are the charges that he talks about in verse 8. The serious charges are serious in verse 7. The charges are he spoke against the law of the Jews. Hey, we don't like this guy because he's talking about the good news of Jesus to the Gentiles. We don't want that. We can't prove that. Oh, okay. Uh, the second charge is that he brought a Gentile into the temple, and that's not allowed, so we're trying to kill him. Uh, time out. First of all, you can't kill the bringer. You have to kill the offender. That's Trophimus, and he's nowhere to be found. They can't prove that. See Lysus in his comments in Acts 23. Oh, okay, well, that one didn't work and that one didn't work. Oh, yeah, well, hey, hey, this guy, he's an insurrectionist. He's a rebel against Caesar. He's trying to overthrow the government. Notice the three charges. And what is it about? It is about the gospel. 
Paul told us that in Acts 24, verse 21. He told that to Felix. He said to Felix, listen, Felix, this whole thing, it's not about the politics. It's about the person of Jesus Christ. That's what this is about. So the Jewish people continue to bring these serious charges against Paul, and they cannot prove it. But Festus, he knows that. But look at what Scripture says. But Festus wishing to do the Jews a favor. What's that tell you about Festus? It's political. It's all about politics. It's not about the truth. It's about the court of public opinion. And I, I can't remember how long has Festus been in office? Two weeks. He's got a political firestorm going right now. I wonder what Facebook would say about Festus. What would Meta do with that? I just wanted to put that in there. What would CNN say? What would Fox News say? What would ABC say? What would BBC say? Festus looks at this and goes, this is bad. This is really, really bad. But because the Jews have such a political stronghold. He wants to pacify the Jews. Really what Festus is hoping, I just want this to go away. It's what Felix lived through for two years in Acts 24. He goes away and I can't prove it. I, don't, I didn't do a whole lot of study about the way Felix left, but I'm sure he's waving at jail. So I'm going, see you later, Paul. You're not my problem anymore. I couldn't figure it out. Here comes Festus, the first problem, quote, problem, Paul. But he wanted to do the Jews a favor. He's trying to pacify the Jews. Really, Festus is caving to the culture pressure. I just want to get this done and over with. It's so much easier to be passive than to stay up, stand up and say something, right? Perfect example. <laughs> it's got that. Thank you. It's easier to sit down and say nothing than it is to stand up and say something. And Festus says, he looks out and goes, this is bad. I've got to pacify the Jews. So wishing to do the Jews a favor, he looked at Paul and he said, Paul, are you willing to go to Jerusalem? Can I take you to Jerusalem because remember just a couple verses ago Festus said there's no way we're doing this in Jerusalem you're coming to Caesarea now look at the turn that Festus did hey Paul are you willing to go to Jerusalem and Paul stands up and says wait a second this isn't right why because of Acts 23 starting in verse 12 Paul knows he will never make it to Jerusalem. Because there's an APB out on his head. And even if he could somehow make it to Jerusalem, he's going to find a court proceeding that is already, he's already guilty and the man hasn't even left Caesarea. So Paul replies and says, I'm standing before Caesar's tribune. He looks at Festus and says, Festus, you're the guy that Caesar appointed, right? Yep then this is the court that I need to be in because this is where I belong because I'm a Roman citizen. Why are you sending me back from Caesarea down to Jerusalem? That's not the place of the Roman court. It's not where I belong. You're Caesar's guy. You're Caesar's governor. This is your seat. You're sitting on your governor's chair. Govern. No. I've done no wrong to the Jews. And look what he says. As you very well know. And that is the problem Festus has. Paul is innocent. Paul knows that he's innocent. Festus knows that Paul's innocent. But Festus also has this group of religious leaders putting political pressure on him to cave. And friends, we are feeling a lot of political and cultural pressure to say 
that things that are wrong are right. And sometimes it's just easier to be passive than it is to stand up and say, no, right is right, wrong is wrong, black is black and white is white. But it's just easier to go, well, it's okay, isn't it? And Paul says, no, because Paul knows if he goes to Jerusalem, if he makes it, he's guilty. If he, if he makes it, because he's got these guys that are in Acts 23, you better believe the militia's fired back up in verse 12 going, Paul's going to leave jail. Let's get him. So Paul stands up and says this in verse 11. This should sound familiar. This is our memory verse of the series. Paul stands up in his own defense, and he says, if then I'm a wrongdoer, but Paul knows in verse 10 that he hasn't done anything wrong. And he knows he's speaking to a governor that knows he's done nothing wrong. But Paul is looking at Festus and saying, listen, I'll let you off the hook. If I've done anything wrong and have committed anything worthy of death, that would be blasphemy according to the Jewish law, which is speaking wrong about God if I've done something in the temple, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, that's an instantaneous death by Jewish law. And if he is this rebel, this insurrectionist against Rome, guess what Rome can do? They can kill him. Remember they had him tied up to flog him just a week or so ago, two weeks ago, remember that? So Rome can kill him. So Paul says, Here, here's what I'll do. Festus, if I've done anything wrong, worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. If you can prove to me I've done something wrong, then in the words of Tom, please kill me. Seriously, take me out. If I've done something wrong that you can prove, then I'm willing to die. He says, but if none of those things is true, which things are that? The things in verse 8 or 9. The temple, the law, and Rome. If these things are not true, which these men accuse me of, no one can hand them over to me. If I'm guilty, then I'm guilty. And if I'm innocent, I'm innocent. And then Paul says the thing that changes the trajectory of his life. I appeal to Caesar. Caesar. He stands in the court. I don't know if he's chained or if he's just standing there. And he looks at the governor and he says, Festus, if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong and you kill me. But if I'm not wrong, if I'm innocent, then I'm innocent. And you know what? I appeal to Caesar. I'm done. You're not sending me to Jerusalem. You're sending me to Rome. I want an audience with Caesar. And as a Roman citizen, you know what the first rights are of a Roman citizen? They can appeal to Caesar. Because Paul's life is on the line. And as a Roman citizen, you cannot execute someone until they see Caesar. To try to make it work in our time and age, I appeal to the Supreme Court. I want the president to hear my case. I want an audience with the President of the United States. And as an American citizen, I am allowed that right. Paul says, we're done. You're not sending me to Jerusalem because I'm going to die. And if I go to Jerusalem, it's a, it's a mock court anyway. I'm already guilty. I'm using my citizenship and I want an audience with Caesar. So Festus Two weeks into his governorship, he conferred with his council. He looked at them and said, I don't know what to do. And you know what they said? I don't know what to do. And they said, this is a mess. This is an absolute mess. So Festus answered, and he did the best thing he said. You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar, you shall go. You know what he really said? I don't care where you go, just get out of my hair. I'm done. 
I just want to govern. I'm tired of this. And Paul has said, I want an audience with Caesar. So you know what? Acts 25 verse 12 is a fulfilled promise of Acts 23, 11. Now if you are like me, I write in my Bible all over the place. It took over two years for this promise in Acts 23 to happen. But now in Acts 25 verse 12, God's promise is fulfilled. Friends, God does not work on my timetable. I wish he did. It'd make my life a lot easier. Are you with me? And if God worked on your timetable, it'd be a whole lot easier, wouldn't it? But God is faithful in keeping his promise. And Paul looks at him. And Paul, I still believe this with my whole heart, that Paul is not being rude or disrespectful. He's not ranting and raving. He's not foaming at the mouth. He looks at, see, at Paul. Paul looks at Festus. He says, I'm not going to Jerusalem. I want an audience with Caesar. I, 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 I appeal to Caesar. So to Caesar, he shall go. And next week, as you get ready to anticipate the rest of Acts 25, 26, 27, and 28, it takes them a while to get to Rome. You got to come back next week for the rest of the story. But as I look at Paul's life and I think about what Dr. Seuss said, we want to live each day as if it's our last. And that's what people will remember. Paul was gospel-centered and gospel-focused. Paul was dealt a bad hand. Hear me, please. He got blamed for doing things he didn't do. Almost got flogged for something he didn't do. Spent two years in jail. I still can't get over that. Two years, boom, in one verse. For something he didn't do. And Paul didn't sit down and have this woe is me Paul looked at that and said, what a great opportunity to be gospel-centered and gospel-focused. You're sitting in jail, you know what he did? He wrote letters. In Rome, we're going to see that he wrote the epistles. He didn't just waste his time sitting in jail saying, woe is me. He looked at the people that are around him and said, they need the gospel. They need Jesus. And I couldn't help but sit and think as Peter was singing the last song. We sang that chorus or that one verse that said, you stand in the fire beside me. We sang that. And I couldn't help but think as Paul goes through this time, you know who's standing right beside him? Jesus. And as you go through opposition, do you know who's standing right next beside you? Jesus. And are you living your life in a gospel-centered, gospel-focused way? In my life, sometimes I'm so busy complaining, I forget to start proclaiming. Let me tell you, I got some things that are wrong. You want to hear about them? I'll see you in the back. Bring a donut for me, not for you. <laughs> and I'll lay out all the complaints that I have. And then you'll add to my list of complaints. Are you with me this morning? Does Paul have a list of complaints? Absolutely. Is he living in opposition? Absolutely. But he's not living his life full of complaints. He's living his life in proclamation of what Jesus did. Amen. And friends, it's time that we stop complaining and start proclaiming. Because our town does not need more proclaimers. Our town, our city, our state, and our country, and our world, they need Jesus. And Paul is sitting in prison going, wait a second, this is not right. And Paul is saying, but you know what? I'm here on Rome's dime doing Rome's business and they're going to send me to Rome. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to talk about Jesus the whole way. I'm sitting in jail. I'm going to write letters to the church to proclaim and not complain. He lived a gospel-centered, gospel-focused life. Second thing is he remembered God's promises. 
I do not want to bring humor, but I do want to bring vulnerability. I wish God would work on my time frame. I read a verse, a promise, I want him to proclaim it and I want to know it now because I live in 2023. If I don't know something, I Google it and I know the answer in point zero 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 one seconds. God does not work on that time frame. It took him two years to fulfill the promise he made to Paul. God will fulfill his promises. And as you leave here this morning, I need you to understand and remember, we know how this works out. Jesus wins. Let us leave here victorious that Jesus wins. We just sometimes have to get through the battles. But Jesus won the war. And how do we know that? He won the war 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross. And death was defeated and my life began. Amen. Friends, leave here. How about I promise to pray for you and you promise to pray for me that we stop living and complaining and start proclaiming. Amen. So Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the example of Paul he was dealt a, in our minds, a bad hand, falsely accused of things he didn't do. And yet he didn't sit around and complain. He stood up and proclaimed. He lived a gospel-centered, gospel-focused life. Lord, may that be me. May that be all of us. As our city so desperately needs hope. Our state so desperately needs hope. Our country needs hope. Our world needs hope. Lord, our world needs Jesus Christ. And we're going to leave this building, heading out into the mission field, not to complain about how bad it is, but to proclaim the truth and the hope that Jesus saves. Lord, give us boldness as we leave. And Lord, as we walk through times of opposition, whether we're facing opposition, whether we have just finished a trial, or we might be getting ready for one, may we live in the truth and the promises of your word that your word does not return void. Sometimes you just work on a different time frame. Yours, not ours. So help us to remember the promises and the truths from your word. Lord, give us the boldness that we need to proclaim your message to a world that's dying to hear it. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.